1995, Jeff Kennett's government sold off Victoria's State Electricity Commission. This is the story of the damage that did to our state and to our communities. When the SEC was here, um, there was another sort of network, there was a big social network. You know, they had fantastic social clubs and all those sorts of things, and there was always something going on. They had so many good things in place. On a Friday night in Mall, they brought in um, the first, it was the first town to bring in late night shopping till nine o'clock on a Friday night, and you couldn't move. You just couldn't move in town because everyone was out, everyone was shopping, everyone was socialising. It was a really great, you know, great company to work for, as you might call it, but a great state entity. We had about 25,000 people working in the SEC. Uh, that was 200 apprenticeships a year in this area. And that's not to mention, say, clerical and engineering. It was the first authority, in fact, the first employer organisation, state or privately owned, that established in 1985 a world first um, occupation, health and safety that was legislated. The training for um, all SECV was second to none. They gave um, disadvantaged people, uh, people with handicaps and so forth, where they could, uh, they gave them work. You don't see that now with the privateers. You know, the monies were kept here locally. It wasn't just used here in La Trobe Valley, it was used all over, over Victoria. Most people don't realise in the run-up to the 92 election, there was no discussion about the uh, possible privatisation of the SECV for the very simple reason, of course, that they knew it would be very unpopular. So what happened here in Victoria, in place of a discussion, we had on the eve of the election, the papers setting out what they were going to do were dropped at, party, at Liberal Party headquarters and there was no report on this whatsoever. People went into that election blind. I think it was widely expected that they, they would go up that track uh, and they did uh, and uh, sold off the assets uh, very, very quickly. What I can say to you is that since those years the, the uh, uh, the friendliness, the good customer relations that the old SEC had uh, disappeared. Before privatisation, Victoria had the lowest electricity tariffs in the world. As a precursor to privatisation, the Kennett government increased electricity prices in order to fatten up the assets for sale. Well, the State Electricity Commission returned to the government, this was just immediately prior to privatisation, $100 million a year. That's gone now. The old SEC was not without fault, but I still think if you were to get somebody to do a, a fairly close analysis of the, uh, the differences in balance sheet structures, and resources applied for maintenance, you would find uh, the SEC was much more concerned about those issues. The SEC, working towards a fire safe Victoria. Now, we were promised um, lots of help and relocation of industry and it really didn't happen. Because I think all was, they were concerned about was some money, not about the people, not at all about the people. If you go back to when the privatisation started to hit and after the second and third contractors started to get in, uh, the Gippsland region went from the highest, uh, from the, the highest employment area to the highest unemployment area in the state. Privatisation was brought upon us and uh, the whole area just fell in a hole. The SEC workers, uh, their jobs were guaranteed with the new contractors. 
um, but that only lasted three years. That was when the real effects started to hit the SEC workers. And I, and I must admit, after I took the package, there was about 10 years, there was virtually no work around the joint. Even the SEC said to a lot of people, well, you don't have to leave if you don't want to, but what they did, they put them in rooms and didn't give them any work or anything to do, so a lot of depression. Now, and eventually, it just gets to you and just say, well, I have to go, I have to go. Those people would picked up the packages then thought, oh, well, we'll just go and mow lawns or we'll go and set up a little business. And of course, the economy was collapsing all around it. Getting work, I was unemployed for a long time. Like over 10 years, I think I worked four. The fathers now, the fathers who are lucky enough to get some sort of work, um, they go away for three or four weeks at a time, then they come back for one week, and then they're off again. So to me, it's like having parent, um, single parent families. Um, and those kids, you know, the kids come into basketball and say to me, oh, Dad can't watch me because he's working. And that's always happened, I guess, but not at the extent that it does around here. It's a huge majority. I remember going to um, a meeting um, when they were talking about the privatisation at the Mall Football Oval, and they were, um, they were talking about what they were proposing to, to do. And I just remember two um, UK fellas that older fellows that got up and just spoke about their experiences in the UK, probably under Thatcher, and that it did privatisation didn't work. And I remember they, they were more or less laughed off, you know, because people were saying, well, that's not what we've been promised. That'll never happen to us. And lo and behold, it did. So, yeah. So one term government gets the benefit of the privatisation. From that point onwards, the higher cost inflation and the higher profit going offshore never ever sees the light of day in your state again. I would say that if you look back uh, to when the SECV was started up, this was, I think, the envy of the, uh, uh, of the world. And there was an ongoing tradition, I think, of service that before privatisation, there was one price for electricity right throughout the state. What Stockdale said uh, that the problems with privatisation which were experienced in the United Kingdom wouldn't be experienced in Victoria because there would be more retailers, there would be more uh, separate, discrete uh, power generators, but people know that you can't compare uh, one retail scheme to another. One of the major costs which aren't factored in is just the sheer amount of overheads once you move from a single entity delivering your electricity to multiple entities. So in Victoria we've got 24 companies divided up between generation, transmission, distribution and retailing and instead of having one CEO we've got 24 CEOs, 24 boards, 24 legal advisors, 24 marketing departments, etc, etc. Now this is all the cost built into what consumers pay for their electricity. I think there's five or six separate entities between the winning of the coal in the Latrobe Valley and the bill that I get as a consumer in my home. There's a current concern with the way energy market contracts um, are carried out and consumers are signing on to these and the information that they're provided. Um, so consumers will often be marketed to, they'll sign on to a contract, they'll be promised a discount and a tariff um, and in reality unfortunately um, those retailers can change that tariff pretty much immediately after the uh, contract is signed by the consumer. So the consumer is investing a lot of time and energy in identifying which contract might suit them, but in reality it doesn't really matter because the contract terms are changed um, at any rate after they've signed. So as we introduced things like smart meters and smart grids and the services that flow from that or the tariff structure such as time of use or flexible pricing that 
that flows from that, it becomes incredibly complex for consumers who face any small amount of disadvantage. So a lot of consumers who um, may be elderly or pensioners um, who have literacy issues or general access issues to information are already in a disadvantaged position just because of the way the energy market is um, progressing. It's a crazy structure. Uh, and so when I was a local member of parliament, uh, part of your job was to take complaints. That was your, a local member's function, I think, to be aware of what was going on. They could get to the source of the problem inside the utilities pretty quickly. That's all gone. One of the major cost differentials which isn't considered is the cost of borrowing. So it costs government 2.53% per annum to borrow money. Um, the regulator is giving the electricity companies up to 9.75% interest per annum on debt of over 60% of the assets. So that's hundreds of millions of dollars difference in the private cost of borrowing to the public cost. The irony is that the majority of Victoria's electricity network assets are now owned by the Singapore government and the Chinese government who are buying into it. One of the major reasons that they claim to be buying into our assets is the higher rates of return. So they demand 2% return on assets or less from their own electricity assets and they're receiving 8 to 10% return on ours. So Victorians are subsidising the cheaper cost of electricity in China and Singapore. Victoria's largest distributor, majority owned by the Singapore government, has increased its profit tenfold in the last three years. They've gone from $25 million in profit in 2010 to $255 million in 2012. The real tragedy of the situation that we have in Victoria is that so much money is being made um, by the private owners, very little of it is being reinvested back into Victoria. And all that money they made, it's all going overseas. Does the country no good? We've lost the control of our own economy. The private enterprises set the tariff rates from householders to industry to, and it's had a profound effect on a lot of Victorian industries. I entered a workforce that was driven by preventative maintenance. That includes SECV, the Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works, the rail industry, the gas industry, you name it, all driven by that creed. Now replaced since privatisation to reactive maintenance. Energy Safe Victoria believes that the equivalent investment should be made to provide the community with a level of service and safety they have paid for. But in reality, the maintenance paid for by the community is not matched by what the privateers spend Emergency blackouts are getting longer since privatisation and high voltage equipment is failing more frequently. Over the last 10 years, all the distributors in Victoria have underspent on maintenance by $50 million a year and that, that's never recovered. And each year electricity becomes more expensive because of the historical underspend. Five out of 11 fires on Black Saturday were caused by electrical faults. That was preventable. It was foreseeable, it was preventable. Regulatory studies told the inquiry failure to regulate the electricity industry was responsible for some of the most devastating Black Saturday fires. Uh, firefighters are being put in a place of danger, which is unnecessary and preventable. So at what cost does this uh, bottom line for a corporate, uh, corporate uh, enterprise uh, come at. This was an entirely avoidable tragedy. The line was more than 40 years old. It was stretched for more than a kilometre. There's no vibration damper. It's only inspected every three years, sorry, every five years. And um, it, it, what's inspected then is primarily the poles. So it was an accident waiting to happen. It's clearly about profit margins, isn't it, really? And um, you know, have to ask at whose expense, because it's coming at the community's expense, where the private companies are increasing their profit through not maintaining as they should. But it's the community that has to pick up the shortfall. The firefighters are now being responded to calls that they don't normally would go to. 
And that's that message to the, uh, any other state or territory that might consider that privatisation is something wonderful. It looks good on the books, but you pay down the track. And the consequences just reoccur repeatedly year after year. Everything is struggling and we are 20 years on and you can't say it's in the past because it's not, because it's impacting on the future. They better have a good look, there's lots of traps. Protest as hard as you can, do everything you can to stop it. Privatisation devastated the Latrobe Valley. And with the advent of privatisation, the apprentices fell by the wayside. We were getting 60 to 70 apprentices a year in the 70s and 80s. Now all of a sudden in the 90s and 2000s, we're getting one a year. And now the skill factor now is gone. I just done a shot out at Luoyang, and all the tradesmen that are working on the turbine are by my age and older and older. They haven't been haven't trained up anyone to do it. So they're going to end up flying four, five, seven visas in from Germany to do the uh, turbine shows. The skill factor's gone. Victoria's got this horrible proposition facing us in 2016 and that is a huge age profile bubble. The younger members coming through and the older workers at the other end, in the, in the middle is this massive hole. Privatisation side of it absolutely decimates the community. It's state owned, the profits go back to the community. If it's private owned, it goes back to their shareholders. That simple. If the system that was established by Jeff Kennett in 1995 and his government and implemented was so good, why hasn't it been followed anywhere else in Australia? And luckily it has not, because it, it is a failure. As the most recent report by um, Professor John Quiggan pointed out, there's been no net benefit to Victoria from the privatisation. <laughs>